All right, everybody, this is In Liberty and Health. Oh my God, I am such a fucking retard because I never remember what episode it is. Um, <laughs> number 35, I got Funk Hauser and Ryan Kane with me today. And these are some libertarian entrepreneurs who made the app Search Liberty. And I think this is really cool. We'll get into that a little bit. But uh, first off, um, let's get a brief introduction from the both the ends and uh, kind of tell us how you came to the libertarian movement and, uh, you know, how you guys doing? Well, first, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, I mean, Ryan, if you want to, if you want to take it away, you want to <laughs> start off with your origin story. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks for having us. I was a libertarian, like when I was like fourteen after the 08 crisis, and uh, just like it was like devastating on uh, like the small town I grew up in, west of Chicago. We were actually like the second fastest growing county, and we had like all these subprime loans dumped on us. Mm -hmm. And we had this insane boom and bust that like was like super disproportionately hit in the county. Um, and like my family, my dad, like and my mom both lost businesses, like uncles, aunts, like all these people were like unemployed and stuff like that. And I was like, just like, what the hell just happened here? How do I like what is going on? And I just scoured the Internet. And like, I think I started finding some, I think the very first one was Milton Friedman. And then I got into Thomas Sowell and Peter Schiff at the time. And so I really came in at like a young age from like a macro econ perspective. And then it was just like, like a never ending series of red pills afterwards. <laughs> and now I'm basically just like an ANCAP now. Uh, and I'm, and I'm like, um, like, uh, just like, I don't know. I don't even know where the fuck I was going with that. But um, yeah, and then my background is I moved to Colorado when I was like 19, I think. Um, and like, like had a business doing like landscaping and then got into tech, taught myself how to code. I was actually like coding when I was like 14 on like MySpace websites. And then I had like a, a business in high school also where I like built a website and I want to like make this app when I was older. So I like enrolled in this like uh, six month boot camp called galvanize and that like taught me like like how to actually like ship an app and then from there i like shipped an app for this client and then that turned into like a full-scale startup and he brought me on as a co-founder did that for three years and i did some contracting for a company called luxor one shipped their app and then uh at t did their at t tv uh app and react native so it's like totally cross-platform like you can get it on ios android like tvs like xbox playstation um cable boxes so uh and then from there like did another contracting thing and so uh yeah so here we are about a year ago uh met funk and then we were talking about um like listing businesses on on like a business listing service and funk you can take it from there i've talked enough about my intro but you can you can go <laughs> real quick uh, so you did learn to code yes <laughs> yeah and you, you know what the cool thing about how i learned to code is is uh, um like i was like all right what's a free market play way to learn to code and i like was just like googling it and i found this like boot camp that had like better outcomes than a four-year computer science degree like it's mm -hmm. something like it's like six months full time and they actually like teach you like what's in demand like right now. So like, oh, no shit. like their, their average salary was like in the 70 K's after like six months. And I'm wow. and, and like, they have like better outcomes and like this, like CU Boulder just down the streets, computer science degrees. So um, I, it's like anyone's trying to actually like learn how to code and like get a better gig. I'd highly recommend checking out like a more serious like boot camp that does like six months to like one to two years. And, and uh, it's like a great payoff for me. Cool. So, sorry to kind of throw that off, but I had to get that in there. <laughs> um, yeah, so I came to the Liberty Movement uh, probably in, I think it was 2000, during the 2016 election. Um, uh, previously before that, I had kind of a little bit of interest in politics. I was more of just um, a contrarian because, you know, in my formative years, everyone hated George Bush. So I was like, all right, I'll like George Bush, even though I had no idea what the difference between it and him was. Uh, and that kind of went on for a long time where I would kind of just troll on Facebook. Um, and then during the 2016 ele uh, election, um, you know, I was like, maybe I should do some more research so I can be better at this. And then I kind of heard um, Dave Smith on a podcast and I was like, oh, wait, this is kind of fascinating. 
And then, you know, ironically, here I am <laughs> all these years later in, in 2021, uh, heavily involved in politics after having, uh, you know, limited knowledge about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of just how I got involved in 2016. Um, you know, then I, I went down the rabbit hole on YouTube, you know, started watching all of like the, I think it started with Thomas Sowell and then Milton Friedman and then uh, started watching Ron Paul videos. And then now um, I think a lot of us in this movement know, know how that go, right? Anatomy of the state. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I grew up uh, in, right outside of Philadelphia. Um, and then I kind of got laid off from my job uh, in at the end of 2018, um, kind of got rehired at the same company in 2019, moved out here to Colorado. Um, and, you know, I was planning to get involved at the local level in PA, but then I got laid off. So I kind of put that on hold, moved out here, uh, finally got involved, became the communications director for um, the Libertarian Party of Denver, um, went to the national convention in 2020, left that all excited and, you know, ready to go. <laughs> then became a, uh, a the outreach director for the state board um, in 2020. And, you know, I, I had a lot of, <laughs> a lot of energy and excitement when I went into it. Uh, wanted to do a lot of things. One of the ones that I, I thought of doing um, was just kind of building a business registry through the LPCO, just so people could list their businesses. Um, and I kind of put that forward at the end of uh, 2020. I think it was the, the last board meeting in, in, um, in December. And I kind of got like one response. Nobody was really about it. None of the rest of the board really even cared. So I was talking to Ryan after that, like, uh, I forget how the conversation came up, but basically I was just like, yeah, I mean, this, they had no interest in it. Um, and not to go off on like a side tangent, but one of the coolest things about being involved in this movement is you get to meet a lot of fucking talented people. And Ryan's like one of the most talented people. Um, so he was like, yeah, why don't we just build an app? I was like, uh, excuse me? And he was like, yeah, no, I can, I can build an app. And uh, so then we started like thinking about it um, uh, early in Jan uh, January of um, 2021. And then uh, now here we are today. Um, you know, it's been, uh, it's been a wild ride. Uh, Ryan's actually the current outreach director for the LPCO. Um, I kind of stepped out, he's, I guess my successor. Um, is that, I mean, is that the correct term? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and now here we are. It's uh, obviously there's a demand for it. I mean, if you see every day on Facebook, people are always like, is there a place to find businesses? Is there a list or, um, and there's been a lot of iterations of this. Um, but they never seem to take off. I mean, honestly, if, if you're gonna, if you want a, a patron, a libertarian business, are you gonna sit at your desktop and search it or are you gonna just pull out your phone and look at your app? So I think that's like the main difference. It's, it's the convenience of it. Plus, um, you know, it's, it's slick as hell. If you've, if you've seen the app, uh, Ryan's pretty amazing. So uh, yeah. It's good shit, guys. Yeah, um, I saw that app. And the thing that really impresses me about this is that it's not just tweeting or shit posting. Um, I I've said for a while now, and my one of my main reasons for starting this podcast was to bring more culture to libertarianism. And it's great to see that there's younger people bringing forth something, you know, a tangible good to the liberty movement. So it's not just, you know, we're sitting here talking shit or doing podcasts. Um, you know, and not to put my resume out there, just to put it out there, but you know, I'm a personal trainer, I'm a mechanic, I'm a musician, I'm an athlete. So all these things are what make me more of an interesting person and perhaps more convincing as a libertarian. You two who made this app and designed, you know, something where people could find like-minded people or like-minded businesses to patronize, that's a great thing. And I think that can really take off because especially in the time of 2021, where you have vaccine mandates or businesses who may not, you know, expose the values that you hold most dear. Um, it's hugely important to support those people, and keep them afloat. So, you know, I, I can't thank you guys enough for kind of putting this product out there for people to kind of latch onto and not, you know, just show that we're not guys who sit in the basement and read Rothbard and scream <laughs> out the state all day. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the, the biggest drivers for us doing this was our, our, you know, Ryan and I's own personal success in Colorado. I mean, one of the big things we focused on um, that's helped us uh, be successful is community. Um, and, and, you know, that's sort of the main driver of, of how we were able to do the things we do out here is because we focus on community first. Just get people involved, get people active, make, you know, people feel uh, welcomed. Um, and, you know, search liberally is that on, you know, a larger scale. And if, if we can get everybody to list their businesses and interact and feel like they're a part of the community, we can make the Liberty Movement, um, liberty, you know, even more successful um, than it's starting to be. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting. Right. <laughs> you, you want me to jump in here? What do you want me to yeah, say? Yeah, no, dude, you're uh, good. You're good. So, yeah, like uh, the interesting thing about the community aspect is like, yeah, we have like a, a deep uh, LP Mises caucus out here and we have a really healthy functioning LP because we focus on like building a cool culture and making it like focused on like meetups and like patroning other businesses and like holding like events like that. Um, so like to do this on a like national scale it, it is big time. And like, just even myself and like so many people have asked like, uh, like how do I find like the local, this guy, that guy, you know, they're in like all these Facebook group comment sections, like asking for this and asking for this, which is like a really good, um, like market indicator for a startup. It's it, look, if people are literally asking for like you to build it. Like you're not just shooting in the dark, right? So, um, uh, yeah, like the potential here is huge and like to have the intersection with the culture too, um, is really important, I think. And I think there's, there's like a ton of opportunity here for other stuff, right? Like we're just starting out, out as a, like a business listing, but like, there's so many different directions that, that this could grow if you prove like you can combine, um, like other things with this certain, you know, niche of a, of a, like a cultural movement, um, which is actually way bigger than people realize Like people don't realize like how many libertarians there actually are. And like, I, we fed in this when I was doing like market research on like the size of the market. Um, I think like, this is a study pushed by Cato and it's something like, uh, 10 to 20%, uh, but at least 10% uh, self-identify as a libertarian and know what that term means, which is a very important part of identifying yeah. as something. So, um, and then like the LP itself, or not the LP itself, but like voter registration, I believe there's like 6 million registered libertarians across the United States. So you're talking like a market size uh, oh, and then one other stat to throw in there is libertarians have a really high business ownership uh, percentage. It's double like the national average. The national average is like 10%. The libertarians, it's 20%. So you could go ahead and think that there's at least uh, like 1 million, at least uh, rounding down 1 million libertarian businesses that are liber like self-identifying as like part of their, um, you know, their ego or the way they see the world so the, these markets are pretty big um and then like another fascinating thing we discovered too is like one out of five business owners we talked to they were just down to support us with like no tangible benefit which is like there's literally no other market like that in the world really where they're like yeah take my money i'll sign up i like there's like like we know you're early um here's, you know, seven bucks a month to sign up and like, just go, just go do something with it. So um, yeah, there's a lot of really powerful like effects here that like no one's tapped into that we think we're, we're on to. Right. Yeah. That's awesome to hear. And I think politics has just become so thrust into everybody's lives um, over the last five years, essentially, where you know, it's like we're everyone's fighting for the ring of power <laughs> and everybody wants to, you know, just wield it so that way they can hold it over everybody's head. And when you guys can kind of put it out there like, look, we're going to give you the businesses that are kind of on your side, right? The, the right side as we would see it. You know, the guys who think like you do, the guys who want to work like you do, who don't care about vaccine mandates, who don't care about, you know, drug laws or anything like that. Um, 
that's just awesome to be able to put that out there and to have people support that. And like I said, especially with this stuff going on over the last two years where now you're being threatened, basically, you don't have basic human liberties if you don't take a, a medical procedure. Um, just finding those places that are willing to have a sack and say that we're not going to put up with this is huge. I mean, even <laughs> the bastion of the free world himself, Mr. Donald Trump, he has a, a vaccine mandate in one of his uh, grills, which is absolutely hysterical. But it, it's like I said, it's just awesome to hear that there's people out there who care about this and really care about uplifting those other kind of businesses. So kind of teetering on that. Um, you both live in Colorado, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, yep. Okay, how were the last two years for you guys out there? Here in Pennsylvania, there were uh, pretty bad lockdowns, and we were one of those states where our governor had threw old people into our retirement homes, and you kind of know how the rest goes from there. Um, how were the last two years for you guys? Dude, they're, they suck. They're awful. Um, yeah. Like, P Polis is a piece of shit, and, and like, he belongs in prison. Um, he, yeah, they were on like scale of lockdowns. They were, you know, he's a dem. So it's like, it was a more aggressive lockdown. And, um, yeah, I don't know what the numbers are, but I remember like one lady came to like the LP board meeting or I think it was, no, it was a guy he, like he called in and he's just like, I'm desperate, please. They're like shutting all this shit down. Like, we're, we're, are, and then, and then what he said that, like, I remember it was, he's like, yeah, like this, this business loan is tied into the mortgage. I forget what the exact financial instrument is. And he's like, yeah, if like the business goes and they can like repo my house and stuff like that. So like people like, like, uh, like really devastated out here. And it's just horrible to see like Colorado go from like purple to lockstep blue. And then like have all these, you know, it's like probably like the best blue state that received like a giant population inflow so we're pretty fucked out here honestly in the long run um but i mean i love it i'm gonna probably try to hold on for a bit longer but um yeah i mean it's just it's just horrible they fucking they just they devastated this this state yeah yeah i mean we both live in the heart of the beast too in denver so it's extra uh restricted here um currently in my apartment complex you have to wear a mask to go you know down the elevator or uh yeah to, to be in the lobby but the good thing is though a lot of people in my building aren't abiding by those rules anymore i see people all the time with no mask um which is pretty rad uh so i mean and i'm seeing that everywhere too like it, it, all over denver people not wearing masks anymore people are starting to become more and more non-compliant as you know as they're starting to wake up and realize this is kind of just all bullshit so um it is you know, and that's the other thing too. Uh, I do think there's going to be more people coming into our movement um, the longer this shit goes on. Uh, I think people are really starting to realize that it's all <laughs> it's all rigged against them, and I, I think they're searching for you know uh, alternatives to uh, the duopoly. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been seeing like personally an influx of people that were like, I was an independent, now I'm, you know. I, I've listened to some podcasts and here I am. Um, so there is hope for us. Maybe not, maybe not in Colorado, <laughs> but in the United States. Yeah, I would definitely hope so. Um, I'm not in a blue county particularly because you could drive five minutes for me and there's cows and there's Trump signs that are bigger than your house. Um, there's a lot of small businesses here, but um, I can remember it clear as day, the day that Pennsylvania announced that it was in a state of emergency. My fiance and I were actually fogging a chow down in Pittsburgh, which is a Brazilian church area, if you guys know what that is. Um, we were sitting there just eating steak and drinking cocktails, and then our phone's vibrating. It says Pittsburgh is now in a state of emergency. And I remember looking around outside, I'm like, what? life seems pretty normal <laughs> to me. And little did we know, fucking two years later, they'd be talking about Omicron and, you know, still you're going to die if you catch the COVID. And, you know, oh, we might need to do lockdowns again. And to kind of you guys' point, I do think there are a lot of people kind of waking up to this. Um, I have a few friends that still think, well, I, I just don't think we locked down hard enough. And it's like, it, did you like have not opened a book, you haven't read a single article, you haven't looked at a single graph because these states that locked down versus didn't lock down, dude, there, there is no difference. These measures were all for nothing. And if you know anything about this, the science, as in you actually read a research paper like I have, um, asymptomatic spread does not happen. And what did we do lockdowns for? We did lockdowns for 
you know, containing asymptomatic spread. So if asymptomatic spread doesn't happen and you're supposed to lock down because asymptomatic spread could cause this disease to go out of control, then why did we lock down? And, you know, if lockdowns were supposed to stop the disease, why isn't COVID gone when we already did lockdowns? It's either the thing you did didn't work or the thing you didn't do, or you didn't do the thing hard enough. I think I know where you guys are. I know where I are, but it's it's ridiculous. And, you know, like I said, I do think a lot of people are waking up. So that being said, do you guys kind of see a lot of, um, op- are you guys very optimistic about the future for 2022, 2024? Do you think a lot of people are going to kind of go the other way and perhaps do the different thing now? <laughs> Can I ask you a question before I hop into that? Have you caught COVID? Have you, have you got? Yeah. Yeah, so my oh, fiance and I, had, okay. yeah, my fiance and I both had it um, late March of this year, and it was. Uh, I don't want to talk too much, but um, so basically, what had happened was I, I felt like crap for like a weekend, right? Just like not as good as usual, and then I uh, woke up Monday morning. I felt perfectly fine. I drank dark roast coffee, so the shit like kicks you right in the teeth as soon as you drink it, right? So I took a sip of it, and I'm like, something just don't seem right. Take a shower. I cook steak, eggs, and bacon for breakfast. And I took a bite of bacon and it's like this pork belly bacon. It's like real peppery. I tried it. I'm like, don't, I, something, something's just not right here. And then, you know, I finished my whole breakfast, ate the eggs, steak and bacon. And uh, I'm like, I didn't fucking taste any of that, but I feel perfectly fine. So I went upstairs and uh, I told my fiance, I'm like, I think I got COVID, <laughs> but I, I felt perfectly fine. She lost her smell for a month and that was literally it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't caught in the coof yet at all ryan what about you have you have you gotten it i haven't gotten it. i haven't done anything different i've been in crowds of, of people um and like i don't like i wouldn't even know if i did have it like i feel like me and funk are like pretty healthy dudes and yeah. like you know just your risk of like getting that injection and having like a heart condition is so much more and there's like so many layers to the covid bullshit like i was like yeah. autistically reading up on it like even like, like, like in early 2020. And then it's like, well, there's, here's three layers and any one of them, you know, disqualifies like the official narrative. Now at this point where it's like, you're like 13 layers in of like just total bullshit. It's like, I'm just like fatigued of talking about at this point. Like, I'm just like, I'm just not going to comply. Um, like if it, if it gets to a certain point, I'm just going to move. Uh, and I'm just done talking and like talk, talking about it. like not in this podcast, but like I, like mm-hmm. I'm over it. I'm so over it. I think a lot of people are feeling that same way. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I am optimistic because like I see what's going on in the crypto space, and there's a lot of really interesting things going on there where you're challenging fiat banks where there's that's like the source of power for all like the whole oligopoly yep um and you know i'm really interested in DAOs, like decentralized autonomous organizations so like i think these are going to outcompete governments over time and other like oligopic uh in, institutions like that so i really see like fiat currency on it's like uh, like on its last leg in history even because um like Oh, I forget who said this, but um, like voluntary games always win in the long run because there's no enforcement cost. Like when you have people from all over the world, um, uh, like just just that has a free market money and, um, you know, they're earning like 10% yields on, on their cryptocurrency because, oh, wait, that's like what a central bank is skimming off the top. Um, like this is like what a real market looks like. Um, I think I think fiat's doomed and I think it's just going to inflate into nothing and then crypto is going to suck away its market share and people don't understand like the new blockchain tech that's coming out. I'm extremely bullish on Solana and building on Solana. Um, You can do a transaction around the world for like one tenth of a penny and you could send, you know, ten million dollars and it's totally safe and it takes 0.4 seconds. So you all these new applications that are on par with your Facebooks and Twitters and stuff like that are like, there's like a Cambrian explosion in that going on right now. And like, you don't really see it unless you're like a developer and you see you're like in the logs and like in the chats and stuff. But um, like, I think, you know, in like three years, it's going to be like, everyone's going to have, I think we're in like 1995 for like HTT, like for, I mean, internet adoption for that. And I think that's going to be the real, 
um, catalyst that really like ends all this bullshit. Cause you're even seeing like all these cri- like crypto nation state type stuff popping up where you have like your El- like your El Salvador doing its Bitcoin stuff. But then also you have like these interesting projects. There's one that's called Praxis and uh, mm-hmm. like they have a token for like a community and they're trying to like buy out like some island in the Mediterranean and like rebuild like a Greek looking like Greek aesthetic uh, like city city state basically. So you have all these like, and I think they've got a couple million bucks invested. I don't really know. I've been asking to see like, wait, how much does people put in? And they said they're really well funded. Like, um, so, and then you see like people flocking to Miami because Miami is embracing, you know, the crypto scene. And then you see, um, you know, actual nation states popping up with Praxis and then other nation states competing with this stuff. And, um, and then like FTX uh, and like Alameda, they just moved to the Bahamas because they are d- like down to like compete at like, at, like with no ta- no income tax and like a fair like crypto regulatory environment. I don't think the US government can get this under its control. Um, the Chinese, like they banned Bitcoin and then in like three days, it was at a new all time high. And then like we like the uh, the Americans just basically picked up all that mining slack. So I think that will probably be like the big geopolitical error that that China makes. And um, you're going to see like this is just going to keep accelerating, accelerating, accelerating as like the inflation keeps accelerating, 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 too, because you have to keep printing. Otherwise, the whole system blows up. And like the second that they default on that Treasury bill or, or whatever, however it happens, like it's going to be like a oh shit moment like oh here's the big you know here's the big you know catalyst so i'm bullish in the medium to long term uh right now i think they're still in the fucking power orgy though and i'm and um and yeah it's just getting more fucking ridiculous too it's it's clown world but it, their their time is their time is coming to an end and i think it's really a big part of the fiat bubble thing you know they're in the end end game of blowing these giant bubbles and um and it's invaded the culture in all these sorts of weird obscure ways which is really interesting to explore like how fiat uh like subverts a culture in a certain way and you know when you like you, if you think about it, it's like things are ba- based on borrowing well what's borrowing mm-hmm. based on like presenting a a certain image so you get like like more fiat dollars and if you get the fiat dollars you're already winning because like there's always all this inflation so like like i think that's profoundly affected like startup space they all just go and raise money instead of like building a product and getting making a profit and then using the profit to like uh reinvest in the company like a, a company would in like the 60s or 70s and like a or 50s or 60s <clears throat> non like weird environment all right i just ran it for a bit funk what do you think man uh, <laughs> wait, did you want to respond to that, Kyle? Yeah, just real quick. Um, I- I'm glad that you mentioned the yield. Um, I- my fiance and I were going to pay. Um, we just in- pretty much inherited a camper off of her father. And uh, it-, it was funny. I was looking at the sign at the bank and it said, uh, here's your interest rate for uh, you know banking with us. And it was like 0.65%. So inflation right now, by the way, they measure it is like 6%. If you measure it, you know, and in the realistic way, and you got you mentioned Peter Schiff earlier, but it's like fifteen percent. So if your interest rate, yeah, Shadow is, Stats is a great uh, website for that. They okay, yeah, it from like the from the like the pre nineteen nineties metric. Okay, yeah, I'll have to look into that. I um, yeah, make sure you send that over to me so I can check that out because it's really interesting. But um, it's good that things pay yield because um, with these record low interest rates, zero percent interest rates, um you don't earn anything you have zero reason to save anymore so you might as well just unload all your dollars and i i really don't know that much about crypto um i'm very skeptical on it i I like a lot of the stuff that you were saying and it does make me a little bit more optimistic i'm actually having uh, natalie brunel on next week if you know who she is um i'm very intrigued by the crypto stuff but i don't know that i'm all aboard the train yet i just don't know enough but um yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that, and I didn't know that. That's super interesting, and it definitely uh, gives me hope for uh, the future. So, sorry, I kind of went on a little bit there, but yeah, fuck, go ahead, brother. Um, yeah, I guess so. 
I'm more of like a people guy and I, and I kind of touched on this earlier, but I'm just seeing it in the culture. I'm seeing it, you know, I went back home for Thanksgiving and a lot of people that were kind of sort of not against the, the lockdowns or the mask mandates and all that shit were kind of now being like, yeah, no, Trump 2024 <laughs> and stuff like that. So um, I'm seeing people being red pilled all over the place. Uh, you're seeing even, you know, celebrities now kind of start to speak out more and um so i am hopeful for the future and i i unfortunately i know uh 2020 2021 have sucked for a lot of people but i think in the long run it, they're going to be the the most pivotal years um in terms of you know long-term uh freedom um i think it's going to be you know the, the driver of why we live uh, in a freer society uh, down the line, because I think, I think the masses are being woken up, um, you know, seeing your, your friend's business get shut down or, you know, have their lives ruined or commit suicide because they've been locked inside their house uh, for the last year, year and a half. I think it's, um, it's, it, it's, it, it, you know, here's the other thing too. It's, I feel like a lot of the reason why uh, the duopoly has been able to get away with what they have for so long is because people have really haven't had an interest in politics, but now it's like being forced down everybody's throat. So they're being forced to, you know, kind of look into it more and engage more. And now they're starting to see like behind the curtain. So now people that weren't necessarily interested before are like, wait a second, something seems off. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could, could, I could be completely wrong and we're all gonna die uh, and China's gonna take over, but, uh, I'm optimistic that, uh, you know, freedom will win uh, in the long run. Right. And I generally agree. Um, I feel like the collapse of the United States as we know it is coming. I don't think anybody can tell you exactly when. I don't think anybody can exactly tell you how. But um, kind of when we were talking about crypto yields and interest rates, um, they can't push it down anymore. And, you know, they, as Peter Schiff always says, you're going to need more monetary heroin to reboot this economy. And they're talking about stimulus checks again. But, um, you know, under a Republican president, Trump, for four years, we spent $8 trillion and the economy hardly even budged. You know, the workforce participation rates like 61 percent because they've printed all this money and handed people free stuff. And all we did was go on shopping sprees. So nobody wants lockdowns again. You can't shut down the economy because the collateral damage is so great and it's in everybody's faces that they're just not going to tolerate it. Um, the vaccine mandates are wildly unpopular. It was funny. I actually read an article and they said Americans are split. They surveyed 800 people and said that Americans are split. Dude, 800 people does not represent 330 million people across the United States of America. Where where the fuck do you go for that? Like you know, uh, San Francisco, <laughs> you know, right. the blue like, like cities. Easily, they could easily pick whatever like subpopulation they yeah. want and like pick ahead of time what the story they want to tell is. And it's, and they're ever like totally like against like the narrative. They'll, they'll like, if it's going against them, they'll try to slow it. But um, yeah, that, like I don't trust any of these statistics anymore that come from the oligopoly. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just total bullshit. All the polling and stuff like that too. There's a great book on this called How to Lie with Statistics that like everyone should read because like um, there's almost like an infinite amount of ways to sell like with just numbers and people see numbers and they go, same thing with the science. They're like, oh, authority. This guy's like thought this through and done this. This is the science, like the science trademark. So people uh, need to like figure out um, like what is their incentive, first of all, like before. Right. So um, numbers. I've heard somebody say once, um, if you hear two people talking and those two people are more educated than you on a certain subject, then you can usually tell who's smarter than you on a subject, but gauging which of those two people are smarter than the other is incredibly difficult. And I find that to be very, very true. And I think a lot of people kind of realize that over these last two years, because you look at all the experts and then experts who disagree with them. And it's like, how are you supposed to know who's right, who's wrong? And then if you learn how to read studies or research papers, you'll see that sometimes the conclusion that people draw from a study is complete is the complete opposite of what the study actually says. 
but you know they'll kind of take a sentence or two out of it and then push that up front just so that way they can use that to describe what they're saying you know that's literally cherry picking which is surely what they did over these last something years. that i've seen scientists do and like if you like read their papers actually if it's like if their conclusion is the exact opposite of like the you know pre prevailing academia um thing the, they'll like or the prevailing academia um, like consensus or it's like a politically charged topic mm -hmm. um they will like signal to other people that are actually in in like uh interested in that field by saying like the exact op like doing a really hard opposite conclusion so it, like they're kind of like winking at like other people and then they're providing the data right so um, like I've seen that in a couple of, of stuff related to uh, COVID where, where you could, they're like, yeah, there's absolutely no proof of any effectiveness at all. And it's just like, there's one of these kind of interesting, you know, behaviors I've, I've noticed that might be interested or you might be um, interested to know about because like you can't just read the conclusions so and you have to actually like look at that data if you want to know the truth. Yeah, sometimes reading through the nitty gritty stuff of uh, research papers can be very, very tedious because I know when I was looking into vaccines and especially for uh, people who might have like blood clotting disorders, um, I remember reading through a paper and I'm like, I can't like this is like not English to me. <laughs> I don't understand a single term in here. Uh, Funk, you got anything to add? We've. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I just want to go on the record and say uh, yeah. that I am. There are terrible rumors and lies going around out there that I am vaccinated. I am, in fact, not vaccinated. It was a Photoshop fo uh, picture, uh, and I am not vaccinated. I just want people to know that. Just he had the fake arm. There. He had the fake arm. <laughs> no, I have like a picture from the 2020 um, uh, uh, national um, convention where I'm holding like my uh, delegate badge and it says Funkhauser on it because nobody knew who the fuck I, I was when I was going by my real name. Um, and I'm also wearing a mask in like the photo. And this was at, at the height of the lockdowns. And also, you know, I, it was a rough morning. I looked better with the mask on. You know, I looked like a fucking Mortal Kombat character. Um, and I had someone Photoshop a fake vaccine card over my, you know, my badge. And I posted that on Facebook because I thought it was funny. And like 70 people like unfollowed me because uh, I guess they thought it was real. So I'm like, no, it's, I'm not, I'm not vaccinated. So just want to get that out there. Well, you know, this shit kind of annoys me because I've grown increasingly skeptical of the vaccines over the last year. But like if somebody took it, who cares? I see libertarians literally arguing with each other because one decided to get vaccinated. It's like, is this really the hill you want to die on? Like you're, somebody got vaccinated and you're like pissed off at them for it. I really do not care who gets vaccinated. That being said, if you're telling other people they have to get vaccinated, that I have a problem with. Yeah. Don't, you know, let that be a medical decision between that person and their doctor. That's the way it should be. But like, if who cares if another libertarian went and got it? If they think that's the best thing for them, I don't care. I'm not going to get it because there's really only downside risk for me and my fiance at this point because we both already had COVID. We recovered. We had an antibody test that proved that we had it. Um, we're probably going to go again because it's been about going on nine months since we had COVID. So it's kind of curious to see what our antibodies look like now, but I just don't think that's a fight worth having. And some people will fight tooth and nail and you'll see paragraphs and 50,000 comments on Facebook or this long ass Twitter threads about pointless arguments. It's like, dude, you don't have anything better to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree fully. If I if I cared about people being vaccinated, then search liberty wouldn't exist because Ryan's triple vax and he got the booster. Fuck so off, <laughs> dude. There's, there's there is zero chance on being that vaccine, and I and I mean that zero chance. Like I'm I, I'm totally fine not going to a concert, not traveling, not doing not doing whatever. I'll lose a job or two. I don't mm. care. I'm not getting it. Uh, I don't care if somebody else gets it. Like that's their choice. Yeah. Um, but like, there's zero chance. Like, and and dude, it's gonna be like one of those fucking mesothelioma commercials where they're like, "Have you ever <laughs> loved one died of a heart condition in the last like in the last fifty years?" Uh, like, 
Like, hey, we have this class <laughs> you may action. be liable for compensation. Yeah, we have this class action lawsuit against against Pfizer, who now is like worth ten trillion dollars because everyone's taking a vaccine every two months. Yeah. Well, you're not allowed to insult Dr. Fauci. What, 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 <laughs> I am the science. When they criticize me, they're criticizing science. They don't realize they're criticizing the truth. <laughs> that, was, that was a good one. Thanks, thanks. I try, I try. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, like I said, the, the fight over it's so ridiculous. And I had Spike Cohen on for my fourth episode, and we were talking about how to like convince people to be against vaccine mandates. But... If you look over at Israel or I think it's Sweden or Switzerland, both those countries have high vaccination rates, which, okay, take that as you will, but you know why they have such high vaccination rates? Because their government didn't lie to them. Their government didn't do the, you know, this card one day, this card the next, where, well, if you get vaccinated, then you can't spread COVID, you can't get COVID, you're going to be fine for the rest of eternity. But then, you know, two weeks later, say, oh, well, you got to put your mask on, you got to double mask, you got to vaccinate your kids, you got to vaccinate your dog, you got to vaccinate your goldfish. Um, they never did that over there. They just said, hey, we don't know how effective this is. Um, it's there. It's free. Take it if you want. Don't if you don't want to. Here in America, we tell, you know, we're all over the freaking place. People say, oh, it's just how science plays out. Well, no, if they were honest about it, more people probably would have got it and it wouldn't be such a big fucking deal. But our government's such a fuck up. It's so terrible at everything it does. They're the only people in the world that could really fuck up this rollout as, as bad as they did. And the most frustrating part about the GOP for me is that their main guy, Donald Trump, can't shut the fuck up about it. Uh, we built the greatest vaccine ever and don't take it away. If if you insult or skeptical about the vaccine, you're playing right into their hands. I got my booster. It's the greatest. You're all going to love it. And those people who are anti-vax are very terrible. You shouldn't listen to them. It's, well, of course it's so ridiculous. he fucking loves it. It's because it was a program that he did. And he's the greatest, biggest, bestest, smartest guy ever. You know, Trump's yeah. a fucking idiot. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, he had this phenomenal, uh, like, uh, intuition that was really great he's a funny guy i think yeah. he's a fucking hilarious person but uh you know at the end of the day like he was not that you know savior character and you know he, he threw the january 6 people under the bus mm -hmm. didn't pardon didn't pardon assange or um snowden Ross albrecht yeah. our, our snowden and you know just like you know basically the, the deep state just fucking dicked him down the entire time and he was just like he was just like yeah like you know look at how pretty i am and they're like yeah you're pretty donald and and then they and then like who knows what actually went on with those elections but you know what's interesting is there's there's not zero fraud in, in, in anything so so like i wouldn't be surprised if they had some sort of you know, you know, seeing in how the Democrat, there's a really great book, book called The Blueprint about how, you know, the Democrats actually um, win these states and stuff. And they mm -hmm. form like this whole network of like nonprofits and stuff like that. And then, and then those nonprofits, they'll go out and they'll bust people into places. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if they just hyped up a lot of you know, local midwits on like, you know, stopping Hitler and they stuff some boxes and stuff like that um so yeah i don't know where the fuck i was going with that but uh whatever funk, funk jump in here what, what do you got what do you what do you think about stuff funk um i mean so it's interesting um i i think what's really telling is that uh anti-mandate is becoming synonymous with anti-vax and i think there's a a, a real opportunity to, opportunity there to kind of you know, I think one of the, the, the main issues in this country and why it is the way it is, is because many people don't understand politics. They don't understand the theory of it all. They don't understand, you know, it, it's not really articulated in a way in school that kind of makes you go, oh, that, that makes sense. I mean, um, again, I, I, I came into politics because I finally heard it articulated in a way that was, you know, comprehensible and made sense and made me think. Um, and I think again, like this, this presents another opportunity for us to be like, well, no, this is actually a clear difference between being anti-vax and being anti-mandate uh, and kind of going into the whole idea of force um, and coercion by the state. Um, so yeah, again, long-term, I think it, it, it kind of, it, it, I don't want to say, I guess for lack of a better term, it does benefit us, this kind of shit going on right in front of everybody's eyes. 
Um, and it, I, I think it's like, it's a massive opportunity for us to be on all our platforms kind of explaining the difference. So people, I mean, that's some people that I've kind of brought like, uh, that I know um, personally that I've kind of explained this kind of stuff to it's, it's basic concepts like that, explaining the difference between, you know, what would be um, the difference between being anti-vax uh, and anti-mandate um, and all over the spectrum of, uh, you know, politics. Because a lot of people just aren't aware. They don't understand the difference. And um, I think if we, if we move forward with, with stronger, more articulated messaging, uh, just more education on all of this, I think people will come flocking to the liberty movement um, I think um, what has really like happened is like Americans have been spoiled for a long time by having a pretty well restrained government. And of course, that's just been slowly going the opposite direction for like 100 years. But now it's like really at a breaking point where there's cracks showing everywhere and, you know, the water's starting to flood through on people. And so then they start like, trying to actually get curious about like what the state is and stuff like that. And then there's just like too many red pills to begin with. And then that's like, I think that's like the whole QAnon phenomenon, right? They're like, all right, what's actually going on here? And then you have like, you know, Judy in her sixties, like, like, oh my God, like they've been like, like all the, all, all this fucked up shit. And then you have like the Epstein, you know, you know the the you know deep depravity of like the actual people on the deep inside and you layer that on top and then you have you know this whole like QAnon phenomenon but then like you know the left's doing the same thing but they're blaming it on you know the corporations you know there's always like it's always like a greedy corp corporation guy but they never put the fucking dots together that it's the corporations that are like in bed with the government mm -hmm. that are like the evil ones basically so yeah, we think like, it's just gonna, I, I think it's just gonna get more hectic, like short term, it's, it's just gonna get more hectic. It's gonna keep accelerating. But um, I, but like the, the medium and long term, I think we're gonna see some really interesting stuff going on with like people decentralizing and becoming more, you know, freer and international in the long run probably gonna be a wild ride until then i don't really know and i do wake up on a lot of days like black pilled i'm like oh my god how the how the fuck is this whatever this kid you know the 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 how is this kid and like this you know whatever the weird shit like the kid stuff is the black pilling shit to me too it's like mm -hmm. hey and there's all these adults in this room teaching this kid this shit and like no one was like hey like this is this is bad they're actually like it was like opposite they're encouraged by that and like they, they think they're like priests or something which is like basically what they are the left has become i view the left now as like the far left it's like the mormon church i really don't see them as much different right but, that's why like the uh term is the cathedral but I, i've this has been one of the most frustrating things over the last two years is the fact that um they've taught kids that they're just innately harmful because they're going to go outside and breathe in the coof and then spread it to absolutely everybody under the sun. And I literally see kids walking outside by themselves with a fucking mask on to their bus or to the bus stop. And I had somebody argue with me, Oh, well, it's just a mask. It's not about the fucking mask. <laughs> this is about telling children that they're harmful just for existing. I'm sorry. If you do that, you are a piece of shit and I'm not going to continue on what I think should happen there, but it's it's disgusting because they're vulnerable they're impressionable and they are our future you know i want to be we have no idea day. what yeah. like what's going to happen to these kids that grew up like singing songs that like to keep your fucking mask on when they're like four years old yeah you know? yeah what the fuck is wrong with you what the fuck is wrong with people to think that that's okay to literally tell children well you may kill grandma so we're going to sacrifice your enjoyable youth so that way grandma can live another two years well I'm sorry, grandma got to live a good life. So, you know, and, and in sure the meantime, if she just had like the medicine they banned from the beginning, like that wouldn't even like come to that at, at right. all. <laughs> right. It's, it's the most disgusting thing about this. And it's, it's so funny that some people are, oh, well, it's just a mask. It's a small inconvenience. It's, it's not about that. This is about the cultural shift that's going on to teach children to be compliant to ridiculous orders that don't work. And children aren't the drivers of the spread of COVID. 
they don't, you know, they get it, they clear it so fast, they're not very symptomatic. So they're not, you know, these vectors for contagion and treating them that way is, is harmful. It's incredibly harmful. And it's, if anybody has not woken up to the fact that the corporate press is the enemy of the people, then I don't know what you're waiting for. You know, it's, it's disgusting. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, you see like, these videos on Facebook of like kids in school, like little kids, I guess maybe a preschool or daycare, and they're trying to pull down the mask and the, you know, the, the aide is pulling it back up and they're repeatedly pulling it down. Uh, and there's people that think that's okay. And that's, that doesn't sit well with me. It's very, I think a lot of the people that are very pro that don't have kids or aren't very family oriented. Um, yeah, it, it's just, uh, I don't know. Now, now I've, I was all optimistic at the beginning of this podcast. Now I'm feeling black pilled. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I was feeling that way it's yesterday. I'm sorry. It's, it's never God. ending yeah. like roller coaster of, of the black to the white to the black. Yeah. So yeah, I think, yeah, long-term mid midterm, it's going to be dicey. Um, short to midterm, but. Uh, so uh, let me, do you have, so th this is, uh, you know, I know you're very into health. Do you have any, any recommendations for, listeners of what they can do to protect themselves from COVID? Well, if anything, you should start off with what you can do and what you are able to do. So one of my biggest, or probably the two biggest tips I would give anybody, try to increase the amount of protein you eat every day and then 10 minute walks after every time you eat. Those two things alone, there were actually studies done on 10 minute walks post meal, um, were actually twice as effective as metformin, which is the most prescribed drug for uh, diabetes. So basically that 10 minute walk after meals is gonna help you digest your food and lower your blood sugar after you eat. So let's say you have a, car a high carbohydrate meal or you know even a high protein meal and your blood sugar spikes up. Once you take that 10 minute walk, that's gonna help even it out. And then like I said, it's gonna get, um, it's going to improve your insulin sensitivity and it's going to improve your digestion. You'll feel better. You'll burn a little bit more calories. That's huge. Protein is also incredibly satiating. So when you increase the amount of protein in your diet, you're going to be more satiated. So you're not going to need to eat as much. And protein is a higher thermic effect of food, which means the protein that you eat, if you eat hundred calories of protein, then 30% um, of those calories are going to be used in digestion. So really you only have a net of 70 calories. So those two things alone are going to be huge in improving your health overall. Um, and they're very, very simple and very, very easy for everybody to do. So when people are looking for a way to improve their health, those two things alone will go very, very far. And we know that relating to COVID, um, metabolic health is huge. I mean, we can't overstate that enough because the mainstream media has not told you that at all. They never told you to get healthy. They never told you to, you know, go outside, get a little bit more vitamin D. They never said improve your overall, overall metabolic health so that way you clear COVID faster and COVID isn't as severe. Never heard that. Why? Why? It, to me, it looks like that's just a way to, you know, get people to take the medicine that you're trying to sell them. Donald Trump took millions of dollars from big pharma. Joe Biden took even more. And what do you hear? Get vaccinated, roll up your sleeve. There's nothing you can do other than stay home and wear six masks or else you're gonna get the coof and die. Um, I don't agree with that. Once again, if you wanna get vaccinated, that's fine. But actually the other thing is, if you wanna steel man the vaccine argument, then people who get healthier actually have a, a better response to vaccines than people who are unvaccinated. Um, one of the podcasts I have pending going out right now, um, your fat cells actually serve as pretty much a reservoir for COVID. So the more adipose tissue or fat tissue that you have, the more likely you are to have a more severe case of COVID. I mean, there's plenty of research papers on this too. So if you can reduce the amount of adipose tissue by let's say 10 minute walks, a little bit more exercise, a little bit better sleep, a little bit better diet, then you'll greatly reduce your chances of severe COVID and overall mortality. And you'll increase your uh, life and kind of central to the theme of this podcast. If you get healthier, then you're able to live a life full of liberty longer. Um, there's studies on um, mortality and grip strength as well so if you have greater grip strength then you're actually more likely to uh live a longer life so that's a little bit of a long tirade but um yeah it's uh, just a, i'm all about the grip strength all right this is yeah i did well you, you know uh, if, if you want to have kids then uh you know a great way to pull women in is with a uh, good finger strength right something along those lines <laughs> <laughs> well to be honest i've gone two years without covid uh and, uh, you know, and this is a suggestion for everybody, especially the children, uh, 
about three fourths of a pack of marble lights a day will keep COVID away. Um, now, I, honestly, though, you, like you, I, could, you could round that up to one pack too, just to be safe. Depending yeah, on your body yeah. weight. Real yeah. quick, um, you know what's funny is actually nicotine users actually had less severe cases of COVID than people who didn't smoke because um, COVID nineteen actually affects your vascularity, and nicotine has a protective effect on your uh, vascularity. Yeah, I mean, I kind of it's I heard that, and I started asking like everybody else. I I quit smoking, by the way. Um, I chewed just to the gum now. Uh, so, um, but a, a lot of people that I knew that smoked, I asked them, I'm like, have you gotten COVID? And they're like, no, not at all. So smoking is good for your health, kids. Do it. <laughs> yeah, and if strangers offer you drugs, never say no, because drugs are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is, this is getting the gold. resale value. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah, take them and resell them. You yeah, know, we're, we're libertarians. We're all about agorism, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting how COVID affects everybody differently. Like, I, I can't, I mean, I'm joking about the cigarettes, uh, yeah. but I've been out. Like, I've been out. I don't really wear a mask. I don't, I haven't gotten, honestly, I haven't even gotten a cold in like the last two years. And I, and I mean that, like, so I, I, it's, it's interesting. I don't, I don't Kyle, know have you heard of NAC? Remind me what NAC is. I feel like I have, but it just, it's not coming to my mind. Something, acetylcysteine, it's like a basic amino oh. acid. It's kind of like glycine. So like I've been I, I know supplementing exactly what with NAC yeah. and like I sleep great and like it like it's an antioxidant and like it's like a ton of, if you look at just Google NAC COVID and I originally like heard about it because it was like, in the early 2020s when they were like, all right, we're banning ivermectin, banning hydroxychloroquine, and we're banning NAC. I'm like, NAC? What the hell is NAC? And so I look into it and just like this extremely simple uh, amino acid antioxidant like glycine, mm -hmm. which is uh, like non-patentable. It's like a very simple molecule and like it's great for your liver and uh, breaks up mucus. And there's all these study studies about how it like... Um, uh, reduces severity of influenza and actually like restricts the spread of influenza because it like breaks up mucus and all sorts of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And like our friend actually like Thursday night is like, oh fuck, I think I got COVID. And we just got him like a giant dose of CD zinc and NAC. And you didn't tell me he was going to die? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, well, here's another interesting thing. Is anxiety actually worsens COVID outcomes. Yeah. So, so actually, there's a huge placebo effect to actually a lot of sicknesses there were studies done on people with uh hor the hormones leptin and ghrelin which are basically satiety hormones so there was a group and i'm going to butcher this study but i'll try and um explain it to the best of my ability um all these people were put into this study one group was told that they had high leptin which is like a high satiety hormone so like you leptin i think increases and i get these two mixed up all the time but uh, they were basically told like, okay, you have high leptin and they may have had normal leptin. And then another group had high leptin. They were told they had low leptin. Their levels actually changed according to what they were told, according to the study, by like 20%. So um, that's huge. But this kind of goes back to um, what you were saying. A lot of leftists tend to think um, that if you get COVID, it's a 50-50 chance you're going to die. And it's funny, a lot of the people who kind of lean left who got COVID – Oh, oh my God, this was horrible. And then a lot of people on the right who were healthy got COVID. They're like, okay, well, yeah, you know, it kind of was what it was. But there's there's something to be said there. And I'm not saying that if you're, you know, on your third bout of cancer and you're 70 years old, you know, you could just will your way through COVID. But give yourself a little bit of a pat on the ass, you know, try to have some hope, be a little bit optimistic about what could happen. And that you're gonna make it through because if you think you're gonna die i'm not saying you're gonna die but you know you should take any branch you can get you know yeah 100%. Look, placebo is one of the most interesting things in the world and people Absolutely. like it's just like this word that affects stats but it's like hey it's actually your mind like having like a, a very significant effect on like all these sorts of like possibilities and like sicknesses and stuff. And then like you throw in Wim Hof in there and him like being able to uh, just use his own consciousness to like elevate certain like immune responses and stuff there. 
And it's like, hey, like we are not like a machine that you can just like, you can just deductively operate on. And that's like, that's, that comes back to big pharma, like these, um, like their model gets blown up if you have, like their whole profit model gets blown up if you have any sort of like a therapeutic approach, because like if that, like if that's applied to their, all their pills people are stuck on, um, like then they don't use those pills. And most of the time the therapeutics are extremely cheap and like widely distributed. So um, th- like, I think that everyone's become, not everyone, but there's a massive red pilling on pharma and how like this model uh, is, this model is like, has, you know, uh, just made people way less healthy. It's disease management. Um, I've had a bunch of the kind of health centric kind of guys on my podcast, Rob Wolf, Ted Naiman, um, Sean Baker, a few others as well, but, um, on Kowser. Yeah. On Kowser. Um, Sean Baker's an interesting guy. He's doing like carnivore. Yeah. Yeah. So I did a carnivore diet for two years. We can kind of touch on that if you'd want, but, um, a lot of these guys are actually kind of on our side too, right? They're not full on Rothbardians, but these guys are questioning the narrative as well. Um, they're very, very skeptical of everything that's going on because you know what they've seen it over the last 20 years where you're told to eat, you know, highly processed foods that are hyper palatable. So you just can't stop eating them. And these guys are saying, well, why don't you not do that? Or, you know, saturated fat's going to kill you, even if you look at it and vegan or, um, you know, some carnivores also get a little bit ridiculous to say, if you look at a sprout of broccoli, then you're going to get an oxalate kidney stone. Um, there's nuance to all of that, but kind of what a lot of the health guys kind of focus around is that in my opinion, I think over the last hundred years, the reason why we're so unhealthy as a nation is because we've highly processed carbohydrates and fats together. And that mixed with low protein just makes food so, so hyper palatable and so easy to overconsume. And, you know, you can get it, you know, Hey, DoorDash deliver me, you know, a dozen donuts and a whole fucking thing of Taco Bell. And I'm going to go into a diabetic coma right here, right now, eating all the stuff that got delivered to my door. Um, and you get no, you know, good nutrition from that. And you just ate 3000 calories and, you know, you're, you're hungry three hours later because these foods provide, you no know, satiation, but kind of, that's a long tangent to say that the health and wellness guys are, uh, definitely allies in this fight. And once again, this is kind of the reason why I started this podcast is to kind of bring those people over towards our direction and uh, encourage more people to speak out about what ails us as a nation. Yeah, 100%. Um, It's funny that you say that, like uh, uh, my life has improved drastically ever since I started fasting um, and just cutting out majority of the carbohydrates. I remember remember, like waking up in the morning and just seeing a big carb you know, a loaded breakfast and then just like the rest of the day is shot because I'm just in a fog and I'm, you know, my insulin is spiked and then it, it takes forever to come out of it. But yeah. cutting that shit out and either doing carnivore or keto has been like the best for, for mental clarity and energy and all that kind of shit. I'm not on any of those diets now. I just kind of been eating everything and I feel like shit. <laughs> I'm hoping to get back onto, onto one of those diets because they, they do work. Yeah, so yeah, Punk and I are like super red pilled all the way on all the all the diet stuff. Like I've done IMF keto for years now. It's like great as a programmer to not have like if you don't have like sugar like spikes, like you can stay focused for hours and hours and hours straight. Yeah, so the, the longest fast I ever did, and I don't fast anymore because my main goal right now is to put on as much lean mass as possible. Um, longest fast I ever did, I did a five and a half day fast. I ran twelve miles throughout that course of that week and i worked out every single day and i remember i went running at about five o'clock in the morning on this trail and i hadn't had anything to eat in over five days i remember i was seeing like oily shadows it's just, it's just i don't recommend doing that in case uh, you were ever considering it but um yeah i did carnivore for about two years and i definitely think there's something to um kind of getting introduced into the health and wellness space and going on like a low carb keto or carnivore diet to kind of get control of your appetite and kind of regulate your blood sugar and fix your relationship with food. Although that's a pretty ambiguous term. Um, I definitely think it's very helpful and it definitely helped me. And now I have a better kind of grip on what I can and can't handle, even though my diet more so now looks more like reduced carb where I have about 200 grams of protein a day. 150 grams of fat and maybe 
190 grams of carbs a day, but I also work out really hard every single day. So, um, you know, there, I definitely encourage people if they want to challenge themselves and want to lose weight, um, carnivore diet is a pretty simple, lazy kind of way to get to better health. It definitely worked for me. And if anybody's kind of thinking about doing that, I, I recommend it if you think you can stick to it for a period of time. I just remember getting bored on that diet. That was the only issue. Mm -hmm. it's just, you know, I, I would, never got bored of steaks. What I would do is get like one either. pound of one pound of uh, ground beef. And in, here in Colorado, they have this like great stuff that's like Kobe beef. Uh, like I forget what it is, like A5. It's like a Kobe beef Stangus cow or Angus cow. And um, you can get like one pound of that ground beef for like six bucks and uh from whole foods and it's like super high fat it's amazing i would just literally make one pound of ground beef and just dump it on like a whole box of salad and that'd be like my meal for the day it was just so time efficient um and like yeah. but yeah like it's interesting because you like once you break that like sugar cycle like everything opens up right and then you could do like a more sane like management you're like okay i can have a cheat day saturdays and like then fast it out sundays or something like that but um, yeah, another interesting thing is like corn subsidies, like coming from the Midwest is mm -hmm. how, how the, like the high fructose corn syrup that found its way in everything that's made everyone like fat and dumb uh, um, is subsidized from the government and how the, like those big ag companies that get most of those subsidies have like, like, uh, like squeezed out like the small, small farmer. So I don't know, I, I'm a tangent thinker. So like just some, just throwing some more things out there to catch people's interest in, in rabbit holes they can go down yeah have you uh looked into regenerative agriculture at all yeah like joe joey salatin or whatever yeah yeah so that stuff really fascinates me and it is really funny how the left is all about climate change but they never ever touch that and there is ample evidence that regenerative agriculture um you know rotational paddock grazing um, that's very, very beneficial for the environment because it's a net carbon negative where it actually sequesters carbon into the soil. So right. Right. It, it's very funny that you never hear the left talking about that, but you know, that could be partially because maybe some of those big ag companies are padding the pockets. I mean, if anybody's curious about this dude, Joe, Joe Biden is like the credit card companies, man. He's not some communist. He's not some socialist. If anything, he's probably a fascist because once again, you know, he calls up City Card Bank or JP Morgan Chase whenever they need a bailout. And, you know, they, they probably got his number on speed dial and he doesn't even know what he's doing. He probably shit his pants and then told him that they'll go over to Jerome Powell or Janet Yellen and print them out, you know, a couple billion dollars if their stocks ever take a hit. So, um, yeah, it's 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 just really interesting to me. And a lot of the science around climate change is uh debauchery to say the least and it's hard to decipher what's activism and what's being used as political agenda to kind of beat people over the head into submission yeah i think there's a study that came out that like the earth is like net greening so like all right well that makes just total basic sense there's more carbon in the atmosphere like what likes carbon plants all right so like like all these things like <laughs> like this is such like a complex globe like yeah it, come, yeah it comes down to that you know that that fascist mentality that like i control this gigantic area and i'm gonna make these top-down decisions and it's gonna get better that's really what come like the progressive area it's, it's been like that it's just another extension of it um yeah and, and interesting thing about those uh, uh those grass-fed farms too like um like you actually have a completely different, uh, like, uh, what the fuck is the word? The hormone reaction in the cow does itself too when it's mm -hmm. fed grass versus the, the grain fed, right? So the whole like methane argument, it's totally different for a grass fed cow versus a grain fed cow. Right. And that grain fed that there are, is subsidized that they're subsidizing cow feed with too. So like, once again, like all the worst parts about like agriculture, it's like the government is like right behind it. Um, and then, and then I'd highly recommend people to support like local grass fed farmers because it's really decentralizing money like, away from these giant ag companies also. Mm -hmm. Fuck you got anything to add? You've been a little quiet. <laughs> no, I, I mean, yeah, I agree. Um, I, Let's I, talk I, about search liberty. Yeah, I personally tried the uh, 
the grass fed and I couldn't get into it. It was just a really? different taste. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe I got a bad batch, but I ordered like when I first moved to Colorado from like a, a local um, farm and all of the meat tasted like it, like it tasted like fish. And I, I just, I don't know. That's I kind of okay, so, so there's a higher omega-3 so omega yeah, omega profile in grass-fed beef. Um, that being said, you shouldn't go to grass-fed meat or red meat in general for your omega-3s. That's going to be more like fish or nuts even, if you can tolerate those all right. Um, fish is going to be a lot higher in omega-3. That's why people recommend you take fish oil pills. But uh, I personally have come to prefer grass-fed or grass-fed and grass-finished meat all steaks actually grass fed for about 70 to 80 percent of its life and then it's finished on grain if it's considered a grain fed steak because that's what they use to fatten up the cows but uh yeah i i've just come to prefer grass fed grass finished um so ryan had mentioned search of liberty um this kind of teeters on something that i had a uh i don't know if you guys know who brian sanders is He's making the uh, Food Lies film, but he's kind of like a, a low carb, um, primal diet kind of guy. He's trying to build this decentralized food network all across the uh, country. And I believe he's had some success, but perhaps you guys should maybe get in touch with him. But uh, kind of tapping back on, you know, the whole point of bringing you guys on here. Have you guys had luck with any kind of, you know, local farmers or anything like that? We haven't even like looked into it yet, but I have like, I'm very aware of this idea. I was actually like bullshitting with uh, uh, on Thanksgiving with like Jeremy Kaufman. And we were talking okay. about how uh, he was telling me we, like, um, I, was, I was bringing up, it's like, hey, these, these people are asking for this in the comments section. Like, but like, does anyone know like the legality around this? Because like, there's like legalities around butchering like cows and stuff. So it's kind of like difficult to do. But then, uh, like what Jeremy says, like all like all these like great apps like Uber and stuff like that, like they start off like breaking the rule, like the, like like Uber was illegal like when it started off, but they just got so much momentum that like they overcame the momentum and they like, probably like write a check to the politicians or whatever, and it's like totally cool. Um, but I, I think like the local farm to table, like I could see that being like a whole like feature, right? But you have, but it's illegal. So there's like a way you have to do it so you can have like a contractor or something. And then like what what uh, what Jeremy said was like uh, do like a cow share, right? Because if you if you own the cow, you right. can you can legally butcher your own meat. So like what so like and then if you own the cow, you can like contract an external contractor to butcher like your meat, right? But you can't butcher the meat and then sell the butchered meat. So if you um, like you get like a cow share and then like you all actually own that cow then you could potentially like bring in like a butcher like to to like butcher it and there's like people that have like mobile like they have like mobile like semi trailers they pull up and it's like on the go butchery and like the, then they walk the cow in you know pin like giant pin the head they're out it's done and then like everything's like self-contained and then they butcher it right on right on site and then um so I was thinking about exploring that in like a way, cause like people have been asking for it um, and a way to like do like the cow share thing. Um, but like, yeah, the, the big thing we're missing, like we don't have any food on the app and that's like the very first like category we have in the app and there's like no, no food. Um, so like, it's hard to find restaurants that are, that are libertarians. We found like one or two, I think in, in mm -hmm. libertarian party, but I think the farm to table stuff, like there's something there, right? Yeah. There's there some people in Colorado that they just moved to Nebraska. It's uh, black dragon cattle. They were cattle ranchers. Um, we we're going to, we we're going to do a, uh, we're thinking about um, splitting a cow like Ryan was talking about um, from them, but uh, it was too late in the season, but yeah, it's definitely a, a, an opportunity. It does. Uh, you know, if it's if it's grain finished, I'm all in. But if it's grass fed, mm -mm. yeah, I got you. All right, I've kept you guys for a little over an hour now. Um, what do you see, and where do you see Search of Liberty within a year? Uh, I don't know because like I have to get a fucking job and pay rent now. So, but we're bringing on like an external, like another dev and, and stuff too. But I think if we can just nail down a couple like social features, like maybe like an invite, like get a, get a, like a referral fee or something like that. I think we could really get 
a few thousand businesses signed up by then. Um, but we're working with some really cool people everyone knows in the LP um, and they're advising us. So I could see us definitely, you know, having like a crazy breakout growth year. Um, I don't know though. Like it's, it's hard, like balancing having a job and stuff and like coding for an app. Like it's very time consuming. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we just kind of really officially released, I think uh, a week ago, um, today or excuse me yesterday uh online at least um and there's bugs yeah yeah it's but that's with all apps um yeah uh so you know it's been like just a little bit over a week and i mean it's kind of people are very excited they've been reaching out uh, asking questions and um that being said we also just uh created and launched a discord um it's just search Liberty, uh, the server on Discord, just, uh, uh, that's all I gotta type in. It's again, it's a community, come in, bring feedback. If you have any issues with the uh, app, if there's any bugs, we have a, a channel dedicated to that. Um, any feedback, suggestions, please let us know. Um, we're gonna be using your input to kind of um, guide where Search Liberty goes next. Um, it is a community, so yeah. And we're on uh, Facebook, Search Liberty, Twitter, Search uh, underscore liberty um we're available also on we're and we really Android. need money like we need investors because then i could go at this full time and we're considering doing a crowdfund and getting like a thousand or so people in the movement like as like owner like have owner equity in it and like really decentralized owner ownership also so we're exploring that that might be coming really soon or not, but if you're an angel investor and you're a accredited investor, DM us because like you could be an angel, which would be amazing. Um, otherwise, like I'm gonna have to pivot and, and like and focus on other stuff and like moonlight on Search Liberty, and we don't want that. There's a huge demand here, and we haven't like begun to like explore it. So nice. Uh, well, anything else you guys got to add before we uh, rock and roll? Yeah, uh, it's, we're available on iOS and Android, and we're uh, running a, a promo uh, until the end of the year. Um, list your business before the new year starts. You get uh, fifty percent off your uh, monthly subscription for life. Uh, and the promo code is Liberty Twenty One. Cool, good shit. Well, if you guys ain't got nothing else, um, everybody heard Search Liberty here first on In Liberty and Health, and hopefully everybody goes and checks it out. Hopefully everybody throws all the fiat and potentially uh, crypto at you guys. And hopefully it really takes off. And this was a uh, awesome show. And hopefully people uh, check you guys out. And like I said, throw you guys a bunch of money. So until uh, next time, everybody, this is In Liberty and Health. Hell yeah. yeah. Peace, man.